Hello, welcome to Ants Are Everywhere. Today we're taking a look at OSRM Backend, which was a fan recommendation. I'm not familiar with it personally. It is an op it is a backend for uh, a what seems to be a router implementation called Open Source Routing Machine, and it's written in C++. So let's see what we can see. I guess before we before we dive in, oh, we have. A lot of gherkin, which is a uh, kind of pickle. Maybe somehow Python related, maybe a testing framework. I'll look it up. And then 6.4% uh, JavaScript, which is a significant amount. I'm going to assume perhaps that this is uh, perhaps like a configuration language. Although if this is the back end, you would think that there would be an OSRM front end that would contain the JavaScript. Uh, but let's take a look at well, what's up with Gherkin language and also what's up with OSRM. OSRM. Okay. Oh, you know what? I was thinking of routing in networks. This is routing in a kind of network, but not a computer network. This is for road networks. And it says shortest path routing. I'm going to go out on the limb and guess that they use a standard shortest path algorithm. Um, what do we have? We probably have positive weights on the edges and non-negative weights, unless there's some sort of negative weight associated with uh, like a closure or a, a traffic or whatever. And uh, we probably just want to get from point A to point B. So I'm going to just guess some version of um, of Dijkstra's algorithm or Floyd Warshall, uh, but we'll see. Gherkin. So Gherkin is uh, somehow related to, the, to Cucumber. It elevates teams to greatness. I, you know, that's good. But uh, is there a non-marketing version of what's going on? Uh, it's used by the Cucumber software tool to define test cases. It's some testing framework that has an MIT license, but uh, seems to be associated with some corporate backer. OK, so while we, why, while, while we are here, should we view the demo? Why fork it? Why have fork right here? Do they want a lot of forks with this project? Okay, so uh, here's the API. This is actually less. APIs are cool and all, but I have a feeling the coolest part is going to be the algorithm. Let's see if we can find. Uh, first of all, try opening the demo in a new tab. It handles continental sized networks within milliseconds. Okay. It supports car, bicycle, and walk modes. So somehow they have to have this data. I assume this is associated, or I assume that they mo mainly perhaps use OpenStreetMap data. And I'm not sure if OpenStreetMap has like walking paths, or I guess you can uh, just have bi restrict bicycle and walk to roads, and then um, typically, if there's a sidewalk, you might want to somehow notate that, or a bike lane. And uh, I think things like one-way traffic don't apply to walking. So there's some modification, but you could probably bootstrap a significant part of that from, uh, from the car network. All right, here we go. Flexible import of OpenStreetMap data. So we're using OpenStreetMap data. And what? Let's route from, where are we, Germany? Frankfurt am Main to Prague. Let's walk from Westendorf to Prague.
Hey, it erased my destination. And then what? What is this? That switches them, right? But it erases my destination. All right. And what is plus? Plus adds on and also erases it. Okay. Well, there's a lot of, there's a little, it's not quite the coolest, but we'll try it. Um, I'm also not sure I'm spelling either of these correctly. So how do I get the directions? This shows me where I am. This zooms in. Do I, can I click on anything? This is something about layers. This is like some hiking layer. Here's a biking layer. And then how do I go? Go. How about return? I guess it wants me to pick a particular, um, like promote my strings to, to something it knows about. I really have no idea how to execute a query. Maybe it just wants me to, what did it tell me to do to drop some pin somewhere? All right, let's try one more time. And let's try opening it from this link again. That will show me where I am. Okay, so let's try uh, Nuremberg. There's a pin. And then let's try Augsburg. And then how do I route? Okay, and now it's showing me the routing. Don't know why that wasn't working before, but that's cool. All right, uh, and so this is 188.7 kilometers and it will take me five hours and 40 minutes by bike but i want to walk and it will take me 33 hours by foot cool all right so this is some routing algorithm routing routing algorithm let's find out first and foremost what it uses let's just search for some known uh, famous ones. We have mid-level Dijkstra and multi-level Dijkstra. This is algorithm.hpp. That sounds like where I want to be. Okay, so this is the algorithm header. We have an, algor an algorithm class because we're doing, uh, what's it called? Class-based programming object-oriented programming. We're doing OOP. And uh, we have some templated functions, which is templated by some algorithm type. And the templated functions include things like has alternative path search, which I think is probably meant to be a property of the algorithm in the sense that like, is this an algorithm that can give us alternative paths, has shortest path search, um, so this should be like true for Dijkstra and some other stuff, but maybe false for, I don't know, depth first search. <laughs> you can find a path that it won't tell us the shortest or something. Uh, direct shortest path search. I'm not sure what direct means. Maybe this is like direct in the sense of direct flight. Like we don't leave the road uh, to get a shorter path. Um, has map matching. Don't know what that is. Has many to many searches. This is maybe more like traveling salesman where, or maybe this is to support some sort of optionality. Like I can leave from, I can leave from New York or I can leave from Boston and I need to get to either Paris or other Paris, whatever is, <laughs> whatever is within driving distance of Paris or whatever. Uh, I don't know. Um, although that's a not great example that I cooked up because this doesn't seem to do flights. Um, and we can get tile turns. I don't know what a tile turn is, but maybe that's something about how many um, open street map tiles we cross. All right, so we were able to get some stuff from the algorithms. Um, here's more al has alternative path search. And how is this different? Uh, we have 
this template is templated by algorithm T. And this is actually just a struct, a final struct that's set to a, uh, to, to some false type. And down here we have, it's templated by nothing. I think this is just an implementation of like a specialization of the template for MLD colon colon algorithm, MLD being, uh, probably multi-level Dijkstra. What is it? Yeah. Okay. So multi-level Dijkstra, I guess we can read off from here. If we're willing to like squint our eyes and ignore all of the noise, uh, like template instruct, et cetera. So, um, mul uh, I don't know what CH is. CH is, oh, contraction hierarchies. Okay. So we have a, a couple of different, uh, algorithms to, to find here, but let's look at multi-level Dijkstra. Uh, so it does have uh, alternative path search. It does have direct shortest path search. Um, does it have many to many? Yes. And what about CH? Con what was it? Contraction hierarchies. Uh, it also seems to be all true. Is there anything false? Whatever this is, uh, MLD, multi-level Dijkstra, does not support uh, distance annotation type. Okay, so let's look at contraction hierarchies. It is a speed up technique for finding the shortest path in a graph. The most intuitive applications are car navigation systems. All right, so we'll add this to Walla Bag so I can read it later. I've got some, some carpentry to do later today, so I'll need some stuff to listen to. Stuff like the best of car navigation algorithms. Okay, um, cool. Now, what we also want to know is, what about like Floyd Warshall? No, I'm guessing because Floyd Warshall is like computes everything at once, right? And I can't spell it correctly. No, I can. There's just an, another Ellen Warshall. Uh, finding shortest path in a directed weighted graph. With positive or negative edge weights, I guess we don't need negative edge weights. So perhaps that rules out uh, Floyd Warshall because I think that this is slower than Dijkstra, and the thing that the slowness buys us is, I think, mainly the negative edge weights. A single execution will find the lengths, summed weights of shortest paths between all pairs of vertices, and so this is also something we don't need. We don't need uh, the paths between all cities in Germany, for example. Um, and of course, a, a node in OpenStreetMap is much more general than like a city, right? Because you can zoom in. So if we tried to execute this algorithm on uh, <laughs> on, on something like OpenStreetMap, it would find all of the best paths between all of the, the points on the globe, which maybe you would want to run that once in your life, or maybe um, you want to run that for like Manhattan so you can query some sort of database, but it seems much more simple to, to, um, to just run uh, something like Dijkstra. Now is Dijkstra really the only thing is, so contraction hierarchy seems to be some like optimization. Um, but it seems like maybe Dijkstra. And so what is multi-level? It seems like maybe Dijkstra is winning the day. Uh, there is multi-level Dijkstra, which is some modification of it. Let's see what that is. I doubt Wikipedia has its own entry for it, but let's find out. And then, uh, let's say we can find documentation for the algorithms. Multi-level Dijkstra for shortest paths from external memory. So I'm guessing external memory here means that um, we don't have all the nodes in RAM. We're querying some service that will be serving OpenStreetMap data. That service could be a remote service if, uh, or, or potentially you could have downloaded OpenStreetMap data and it might be all, all on disk, but it's still like external to memory in some sense. I'm gonna guess that that's what it means. Here's some research paper. I'm looking for the... I'm looking for 
is the research paper that the current code implements. Okay. How about this? Okay, so we have these, um, what is CRP? Customizable route planning by Delling et al. And then here's the actual paper. In transportation science. Do we get a real PDF? Okay. This is 31 pages. We'll read that too. Assuming Wallabag knows how to import it. All right. Okay. So the partition step is essentially the same. They just implement it via a different algorithm. Inertial flow that originally does a nested dissection, they adapted it to produce cells. What was it called? Inertial flow? Let's learn all of this stuff. We have balanced flow, which is an atmospheric science thing, but might as well learn that too. So this uh, customizable route planning and external memory is some paper. We'll try to add this to Wallabag too and see if it will import. I'm guessing it, uh, it seems to be struggling with PDFs lately. Okay, so that's kind of just kind of orienting ourselves to, uh, to what's going on. And I'm trying to find now the documentation of algorithm. It seems to mainly be that one. Okay, so let's assume that that's the case. Let's also look at engine in general. So engine has routing algorithms, trip, algorithm.hpp, approach, some base64 stuff, bearing. I'm gonna guess bearing is just some modeling of a of a compass bearing or a, like a, a directional vector, probably in something like GPS coordinates. Engine is presumably just the thing that's going to drive the, the code forward. Hint. I'll look at hint. We have a polyline compressor, a phantom node, a routing algorithms that HTTP, and search engine data. We'll open a, a few of these. Douglas Pecker, Pucker, looks like it's probably some, uh, it's two names. I'm going to guess these are names of computer scientists. This is possibly some algorithm. And they have um, data facade API and guidance. Guidance is presumably the uh, implementation of once you have a route, a guidance along the route, or at least an API to serve up the guidance to the front end. And should we look up plugins? We have a match nearest plugin base table, tile, trip, and via route. Okay. So let's take a look at these. We'll pop out open uh we'll pop out the, the root directory into its own um own window here. We'll look in source. Source has engine which we've looked at, customize, contractor, extractor, guidance, OSRM. So look at uh OSRM. I'm curious what they are doing with with Node.js. Maybe the the reason that they have JavaScript is that they're using a JavaScript backend. And perhaps they're doing that so that they can render uh, HTML on the server and that they need the JavaScript to uh, to implement the, the backend. Is that what they're doing? I don't know. But they also have some API, which seems like they are serving like a REST style API. Uh, I don't know if they're doing that via Node or what, but here's server. We also have storage and updater and util. Let's look at, let's look at storage. We have IO config storage.cpp, storage config, uh, region handle. So I'm guessing, I, I think that storage is maybe like going to be about, uh, maybe like picking out chunks of the um, OpenStreetMap tiles to 
operate on them. So we have stuff about region handle, which could be a physical region on a map, or it could be just a region of memory. Setup region. This is safe because we have an exclusive lock for all OSRM data store processes. Ensure that the shared memory region we want to write is really removed. This is only need if this should be needed for failure recovery because we actually wait for all clients to detach at the end of the function. Okay, we can swap data, giving it a monitor. I don't know what a monitor is. It could be a monitor lizard. It could be the um, the mutual exclusion device that really I think I only really see used in Java normally. Populate layout from file. So you have some file, you give it a path and uh, some base data layout, which I think is an out parameter given that this is void. And we iterate over entries. And the entries are file entries. We're using tar. I don't know if that's the tape archive or some other library. And then we have this storage run thing. We're using boost. And we've got some file lock stuff. And I, I don't know yet really what we're reading from storage, but I'm going to guess it's the street map data. And I don't see anything to contradict that. <laughs> so we'll see. So uh, here is server. Server has API and HTTP entries and service. And we've got a connection, a request handler, a request parser, and a service handler. So this seems to be just implemented in C++. Uh, service handler. We've got these route. Uh, this seems to be doing some routing. What is what sort of object is service map? Whatever it is, it's it uh, has an API like a hash table essentially. And so we see that service map at route is set to this route service using standard make unique to get a unique pointer. And we're passing in the routing machine. And so this is wiring up uh, who's serving which kind of requests. And then we have a service handler run query, which takes a parsed URL and an engine. Or rather, it uh, this is uh, prob uh, it's probably the, uh, the out parameter. It's going to return some sort of result and also give you a status back. And uh, we call service map dot find parsed URL dot service. So the parsed URL knows which service it's trying to connect to, presumably because the service is somehow encoded in the URL. So if you have uh, some URL, it might say slash nearest or question mark nearest equals whatever. And so I guess when we parse the URL, we figure out what that service is. We look up in the map to find it. The map is populated here. And that's just doing routing lookup. Make this bigger. Yeah. Uh, and then once we get the the service iter. Oh, oh okay. Wait, hang on. Yeah, so, so on a um on a, a hash map like object, you get some iterator back. And if the iterator is the end, that means it wasn't found. And so in that case, we create some JSON object, some empty JSON object, and call standard get, uh, I guess, to get the result. And we uh, say that it's an invalid service, and we pass, return that as an error. And um, otherwise, we get the service, and we look at its version and check that it's the same version as the, the version we see from the URL. And if it's not, we have some other error. Otherwise, we run query, giving it the, the parse URL prefix length, the parse URL query, and the result. Why the prefix length, I'm not sure, but I guess run query wants to know it. This is 
service handler run query. And I guess down here we're calling service run query. Like service route service run, run query or something. Okay, so here's request parser. I guess we don't really need to look at the parser. Do we? Not really, but it is kind of interesting that they implemented their own parser rather than using uh, like an off the shelf uh, uh, HTTP REST API thing for C++. And then here's request handler. You can register some service handler which will move standard move the service handler to this to this variable here, which I guess is some class variable. You can send a response, and it send, sets headers and all that stuff. So this is like a implementation of a HTTP framework in OSRM backend, and we have a model of the connection, etc. We don't need to look at the server too much more, but that tells us that. It's not just having a node backend, although there is some node stuff. Did we look at HTTP? HTTP just has this reply thing. And they here they're using ASIO buffer, which I'm going to guess is just some like sync. I mean, async. Low level IO program. So does Boost have a um, like a REST API server? Have there been any attempts to build a REST service on top of Boost.asio or Boost.beast? You can also consider Crow CPP. All right. So uh, I guess Boost doesn't have a a native REST network thing. So in Node.js we just have Node OSRM.cpp. And what? We're doing engine init. The OSRM method is the main constructor for creating an OSRM instance. Maybe it's starting a, a uh, node server. We're including node OSRM.hpp. But why? By running the OSRM binaries, we ship in node modules, OSRM lib binaries, blah, 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 for setting speeds and determining road types, etc. Options for creating an OSRM object connects to the persistent shared memory database. Yeah, I get the feeling that this is calling up. Uh, this is like running a server that is mainly not in this code base. Let's check out this header file. We can init passing in nappy env. I don't know what nappy is, node API perhaps. And we have some, what look like API calls, route nearest table tile match trip. I don't know. Let's try seeing if it shows up on a web search. We have deploying to production. It provides bindings for Node.js, which, which can be used to build a Node server in any framework. OK. I'm not really sure what that means, but I guess um, I guess that means you can build a node server that uh, that is really delegating to um, to the C++ code. Well, that's the AIs. So what is it?
I don't think this is clarifying. So does this mean that, um, uh, so the, the code in question has a server implementation in C++, does this mean that the node bindings are delegating to the C++ server or is, uh, or are they generating node code that somehow duplicates the function? of the C++ server. Okay, so the, the node stuff is just delegating the C++, so that's not especially interesting. Okay, fine. All right. Uh, so in, we have, in OSRM, we have contractor, customizer, extractor, and partitioner. I don't know what those do. We'll take a quick look at these. We're not in the, we should probably be looking at the headers instead of the, um, instead of the implementations, but that's fine. So it says a pimple-like facade. I don't know what contract means in this case, but we have contractor, contract, config, uh, open street map, contractor. And we'll look up pimple facade coding. It hides the implementation of headers and includes an interface file that compiles instantly. Pointer to implementation. Okay. Proposal contractor. The name the contractor who built a binding or other structure. Similar to an architect tag, this information is an important part of understanding the built environment. Okay, so I'm guessing contractor like literally means the contractor who built something. So extract, we have salt to scripting environment. I think Sol is a, possibly a search engine. And I don't know. And we have some, somehow some Lua stuff is, is figuring in here, but we're just going to plow along. Here's OSRM CPP. And we are switching here on some algorithm. And we have the, uh, the something hierarchies. I forget what the C stands for in the multi-level Dijkstra. And then those are the only two algorithms that are implemented. So that answers my question of, is there anything else? Partitioner, I'm not sure really what partitioning is doing. But now, let's look closer, more closely at the algorithms. We have trip brute force. Furthest insertion, nearest neighbor. What is brute force? Edge, so we have this inline edge duration, return distance, confuse the distance of a given permutation. So we have some um, dist table, maybe distance table, a location order, which is just a vector of node IDs. This is, I guess, asking the question of like, if we boot, uh, if we uh, try to visit in this order, um, what is the distance? And uh, it looks like we're passing in the minimum route distance and the number of locations. And we get an edge duration back. And we also have this brute force trip, computes the route by computing all permutations and selecting the shortest. Okay, so this is just, uh, we're gonna brute force by, by permuting and finding the shortest. Approach.hpp is what? We have things like curb, unrestricted, and opposite. So this tells us about, um, Features of the environment, I guess. Bearing.hpp. We have a struct that has a bearing and a range. They're both shorts. And is valid will tell us if bearing is bigger than or equal to zero and less than 360. So it's uh, we're using degrees and it's less than a full circle. We're not, we haven't wound around. And the range is bigger than or equal to zero and less than or equal to 180. So we have a full circle in, I guess, one direction and a semicircle in the other direction. And we uh, have the ability to, to tell whether they're equal or uh, not equal. I'm not sure where this is, where this is used. So bearing here looks like an angle and then range looks like a, uh, array with some length. I don't know why the range has to be less than or equal to 180. 
but that's the way they do it. All right, um, here's engine. What's in an engine? So it's templated by algorithm and it returns a, or, or rather it extends the, the engine interface. And it has some route plugin, a table plugin. It has a bunch of plugins for route, for the uh, route, table, nearest, trip, match, tile. These I think are the same uh, words that we saw in the, the API implementation, the, the routing implementation. So these are, uh, I guess, essentially just some config for um, a collection of functionality that, that will make up the server backend. And we're just kind of just checking that um, preconditions are met. N if you call nearest, we're just going to delegate to the nearest plugin to handle the request. And nearest here takes in uh, nearest parameters and returns an API result. So this is just um, a bit of functionality that uh, that implements part of the API. Hint. Hello. Hello, Ken. Um, hint does what? We've got a segment hint. Represents an individual segment position that could be used as the waypoint for a given input location. All right. So uh, we can, if it's valid, then the, this is not the implementation, but we can ask if it's valid and we give it the coordinates and some base data facade and we can convert it to base 64 and from base 64, I guess for maybe encoding to disk or something. And we want to make sure the hint, the segment hint has some, as the appropriate size, I don't know. This maybe was tracking down some bug or something. I don't know we need, why we need to assert that. All right. And now I think we're mainly left with uh, routing algorithms, although, although we have search engine data. And maybe that's interesting. So let's do this. Let's start with Douglas, Puck, uh, Douglas Pucker. I'm going to guess is how it's pronounced. And this has some threshold, generate threshold and Douglas Pucker thresholds. So this is not, this is something else. The Raymer Douglas Pucker algorithm, it, also known as the Douglas Pucker algorithm and iterative endpoint fit algorithm is an algorithm that decimates a curve composed of line segments to a similar curve with fewer points. So decimate should be literally it reduces by a factor of 10, but I think it just means down samples. Okay. So we're going to take some curve that has a lot of line segments that perhaps we get a lot of line segments because we are doing the, calling the optimization. And I guess Douglas Pucker is going to take it and make it nicer as in this animation. Okay. So that's cool. That is not, I think what I want to see. And, uh, we have shortest path, direct shortest path. These I'm going to guess are, uh, these files, these includes are going to be just templated by the algorithm and the real stuff is going to be implemented in the algorithm. And that's exactly what's going on. And so what do we have left? We have routing algorithms at HPP. Is this what we looked at before? No, I don't think so. Uh, but we see the, what the calls to the, uh, different things look like. So shortest path search will take some phantom node candidates, which are waypoint candidates. So I guess, uh, So the, um, we're going to take a bunch of phantom nodes, which I, I'm going to guess are not real nodes. They're just candidates of places we could possibly put points on the map. And these are the possible waypoints. And then, um, we have some, uh, Boolean, uh, flag about whether we continue straight at waypoint. 
and direct shortest search path just takes the endpoint candidates and it returns some internal route result. And whatever that is, some internal route result. Here's search engine data. We have things like many to many heap data, which has some edge duration, edge distance, and many to many heap data, which many to many heap data. This thing takes in a node ID, edge duration, edge distance. Oh, no, no, no. Wait, wait. But where's this argument? I don't know. Uh, and then we also have struct, uh, sorry, search engine data, uh, with ha which has some query heap, a many to many query heap, search engine heap pointer, search engine head pointer, et cetera, et cetera. So we're doing something with heaps. What kind of heap? I don't know. We have a map matching multi layer Dijkstra heap. And we have things like a parent. I guess the heap data has a parent and the parent is a node. And we have from click arc, click arc. I'm guessing click is maybe click in a graph. I don't know what from click arc uh, is, is meaning. We also have, we're going to record the edge distances. And you can create a struct like this, I guess. Uh, let's see what kind of heaps we have. Let's just do a search for heap. Possibly, well, here, here we have a heap node. We have a binary heap. We have a contractor heap, which I'm going to guess is a heap of contractors and not a kind of heap. Do we have a Fibonacci heap? Do we know how to spell Fibonacci? Mm, not G. Is it two N's and two C's? One N and two C's, the way I spelled it, right? Okay. And so we're not using... Uh, like a fancy heap. As far as I can tell. A uh, heap node has a heap handle, a node ID, a weight, and some data. Inserted nodes and place back. So when we call insert, we give it a node ID, a weight, and some data. And uh, what we do is we take the inserted nodes and call it and place back a heap node, uh, which is, I guess, constructing some class that has a handle, node, weight, and data. And then we say the node index um, at the node is equal to the index that we, I guess, computed here. I guess it's just going at the end, right? And so this seems to be a pretty pretty simple heap. So when we call min, we're going to assert that the heap is not empty. And we're going to look in the inserted nodes. We'll look at the heap.top.index and get the node from it. And so is that preserved when we did inserting? Let's look what uh, what kind of thing this heap is. Okay, so we are using a heap, a real heap. So I, I was wrong about how I was reading that. So we are using a real heap from Boost. And uh, what kind of heap is it? A something airy heap, d airy heap, a dairy heap. D airy heaps are a generalization of a binary heap with each non-leaf node having n children. Okay. And so what's a Fibonacci heap? For priority queue operations consisting of a collection of heap ordered trees. 
better amortized running time than many other priority queue data structures. So I guess the Fibonacci heap is specifically for priority queue. Um, we, this seems to be some sort of min heap. And then we can look at heap data structures in general. Data structures serve as the basis for abstract data types. Wait, what? No. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I had clicked on heap data structure. So a heap is a tree-based data structure that satisfies the heap property. In a max heap, for any given node C, if P is a parent of C, then the key of P is greater than or equal to the key of C. In a min heap, the key of P is less than or equal to the key of C. The node at the top of the heap with no parents is called the root node. It is one maximally efficient implementation of an abstract data type called a priority queue. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I think all heaps are priority queues. So uh, okay. So they're constructing some DRE heap. I don't know why does Boost have a Fibonacci. I don't know when people use a Fibonacci heap. So DRE, here's the Boost uh, li uh, library um, documentation. So it says that a priority queue is a wrapper around the standard library heap functions. It implements a heap as a container ad adapter on top of standard vector and is immutable. A DRE heap, which is the one that OSMR, OSRM backend uses. It says D airy heaps or a generalization of the binary heap with each leaf node having n children. I think that's literally what Wikipedia says. And in fact, they're linking to Wikipedia here. For low arity, the height of the heap is larger. So if we have a small number of uh, n, then you have a larger heap, I guess, than a binary heap. But the number of comparisons to find the largest child node is bigger. D airy heaps are implemented as container adapters on top of a standard vector. The data structure can be configured as mutable. This is achieved by storing the values inside a standard list. I think that we're dealing with mutable heaps here. Then we have binomial heap. And then we have Fibonacci heaps. These are node-based heaps. I don't know what it means by node-based. Uh, that are implemented as a forest of heap ordered trees. They provide better amortized performance than binomial heaps, except pop and erase. The most important heap operation operations have constant amortized complexity. And with respect to binomial heaps, they are node based that are implement, implemented as a set of binomial trees of piecewise different order. The most important heap operations have worst case complexity of O log n. In contrast to DRE heaps, binomial heaps can also be merged in O log n. Okay, so now let's ask um, the AIs when we would use each. I'm implementing a um, a uh, path planning module for OpenStreetMap data. I want to use heaps uh, to store uh, data for the routing algorithms. Help me decide which kind of heap to use. When should I use DRE heaps versus Fibonacci? Okay, so this is telling me that Dijkstra's algorithm, d -airy heaps, especially binary or ternary heaps, are well suited for Dijkstra's algorithm because of their balance between simplicity and performance for the required operations. And the disadvantage of d -airy heaps is that extract min is O of d log sub d n, where I guess d is the d in d -airy, which can become less efficient as d increases, which makes sense. Uh, Fibonacci heaps. Uh, they are uh, complex, 
and the overhead from maintaining the heap structure can lead to a slower practical performance despite their theoretical advantages. And they are useful for algorithms with numerous decrease key operations. A high frequency of decrease key operations. I guess this means like you're inserting something. Um, I don't know if decrease key means max, if it assumes we um, are using a max heap or a min heap, but I, I assume that this means essentially that we are reorganizing the heap as we insert stuff. Uh, so for uh, this is saying that for Dijkstra's alg algorithm, use a binary heap or a ter ternary heap, so three or four, a D array with D equals three or four, <laughs> not four, three or two, um, or use, yeah, a D array heap of small, uh, okay. So that's exactly what they're doing. That makes sense. Let's ask Gemini about it. It's gonna give us pretty much exactly the same answer, at least substantively. And just trying to scroll through, uh, it's saying use uh, D equals two or four if you expect a mostly static data set with infrequent updates to node priorities during path planning, which I think is true. Memory efficient is a major concern. And Fibonacci, if I anticipate frequent updates to node priorities during path planning. Okay. So now we uh, know more about heaps. And then I guess let's take a look at, didn't I do a search for multi-level Dijkstra? Yeah, I think that ended up being that, that whole, all that research paper stuff. So let's look at the, um, the multi-level Dijkstra just real quick in broad strokes, and then we'll move along to something else. So here's the HPP. What about uh, algorithm.cpp? This is a unit test. How about dijkstra.cpp? Okay, let's go back to the Dijkstra search and go here. This is the header. And what if we just search for things that um, import the header? What if we search for MLD? Yeah, here we go. Hey, what are you doing? I'm looking at the source code to the to open street no open OSRM backend. What is it? Open source routing machine. Which is a like open street map based um plan routing algorithm, like Google Maps sort of stuff, directions for uh based on open street maps. Okay. So here's the routing base MLD. And uh, I'm going to guess this is where the implementation is. We have get network distance, and we pass in engine working data, a uh, facade that a data facade that, that depends on the algorithm. In this case, the MLD algorithm, and uh, a forward heap and reverse heap, some phantom nodes, including a source and target phantom, and edge weight which is a weight upper bound. So we're going to clear the forward and reverse heaps, create um, phantom endpoints from the source and target. We're going to call insert nodes into heap, passing in the forward heap, the reverse heap, and the endpoints. And then uh, we're going to call search, passing in basically everything we have. And we get back weight, unpacked nodes, and unpacked edges. 
And if the weight is in, is invalid, we have some error stuff. We're gonna do some assert. Set edge distance to uh, essentially a vector of zeros or of a single zero. And then we are doing this if else stuff. That's, it seems like more set up, but then we have a for loop for what? Uh, for all the unpacked nodes, we're going to call facade get node distance on the unpacked nodes at index. Get node distance from what? Maybe from a specific starting point, uh, which is how Dijkstra works, I think, in general. Um, and then if uh, phantom for uh, if target phantom the phantom for the target if it's forward segment id is equal to the i guess last unpacked node then uh we're gonna increment the distance by get forward distance otherwise similarly for reverse and then we're gonna return from alias double of distance So this is, I think, computing perhaps just the distance of the the um, one point to one other point. Is that right? Where is source and target? Here, these two nodes. I think that's what it's doing. I think this is one, uh, like one computation. Um, that was base. Here's direct shortest path. So direct shortest path is going to take um, engine data, the data facade, and some endpoint candidates, and we're going to call some initialization, some thread local, initialize some thread local storage, get some, get the forward and uh, reverse heaps, clear them, and call search. And then do some more stuff. Where is search though? Shortest path implementation. Let's try this one. Okay. So search is implemented in the in a header and it's uh and it's templated. And we check if there's an invalid forward target. or if there's an invalid reverse target. And then we call search. Okay. Why are we doing so much work if the target is invalid? That I don't know. Am I reading this wrong? Is, oh, sorry, is valid. Yeah, okay. Uh, so if it's a valid forward target that we do a bunch of work, that makes much more sense. Um, what work are we doing? We're iterating over some I ranges uh, that have to do with the source candidate size. So we have candidates for the source, candidates for the target, I believe. No, we just have source candidates. We do have some some target candidates, okay. At any rate, we do a bunch of work. We're, we're like inserting into the forward heap a bunch of candidates with total weight to forward at I, uh, basically populating um, into the heap the distances that we get from the graph weights and similarly for reverse. And maybe the fact that we're doing it forward in reverse is what uh, makes it multi-level. I'm not sure. And then we call search here. And search, I'm going to assume, is more or less uh, similar. Uh, this is C++. Yes, I am a coder. Python. Uh, we occasionally do Python, um, but uh, we ha I think we haven't for a while so far. Uh, what other searches do we have? So we have a bunch of these implementations. One of them is ultimately the one that everything is going to delegate to. And I think I'm going to just basically stop around there. Project.
All right, so that'll be OSRM for us. Uh, I let's just move on to uh, to another one. 